Uh, my name is Yoshinori Ono. I'm a producer at Capcom Japan. Uh, not only my producer, but uh, I'm also now heading up the uh, online R&D division. The first game I truly fell in love with would have to be Taito Space Invaders. Um, at the time, I was already uh, familiar with uh, games you could play at home uh, on the TV. Um, in the States, you guys had Pong and everything else. We had a lot of uh, breakout clones in Japan. And my dad is an engineer, so he uh, was really into technology. So he'd bring home all this cool stuff. I'd mess with it. But uh, not until Invaders did I really like get what the whole video game thing was about and just fall in love with it. Um, you know, video games or arcade games were 100 yen in Japan, uh, and they were always 100 yen. They didn't just become 100 yen, and back then that was uh, not a, not a small amount of money. I mean, it's still you know around a buck. So it was uh, you know you really have to beg your parents uh, to, to to get a 100 yen coin to go play uh, Invaders. But uh, yeah, that was me back then. I did a lot of begging and a lot of Space Invaders playing. But let me just preface it by saying I, I was always in the games. You know, uh, all the way through. Uh, uh, elementary school, junior high, high school, you know, me and my friends would get together and we would uh, we'd make our own PC games, we would modify PC games and mess around with that. Um, so gaming was always a hobby, but I didn't necessarily uh, think of it as, as a career goal. In fact, if you had asked me back then, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, I would not have had a, an answer for you at all. Um, so I, I started college and, you know, at the time in Japan, it was still the, uh, the, the bubble economy, the so-called bubble economy, and uh, the country had a lot of money. And uh, as countries tend to do when they have a lot of money, uh, there were a lot of giant buildings being built. Uh, just a huge construction boom. Uh, so I got into architecture, actually. I studied architecture in college. And my specialty was sort of uh, giant indoor open spaces without support pillars and whatnot. And it was less of looking at it from, uh, from an art design sort of perspective and more just a fascination with how these things work behind the scenes, like how in the world is this room actually supported with pillars, what kind of uh, you know beams do we have on the wall, what kind of structure is going on here. I found that terribly interesting, uh, so I studied that in college, and uh, you know I, I graduated and everything, and uh, didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. I had uh, some, some offers to enter into you know, some research uh, projects, and I was tempted to do that. Uh, I should introduce another thread in, uh, in my biography here and say that uh, I was in a band in, uh, in high school and in college, and basically that was just to pick up chicks. So I was doing my band, and after college I was still doing it, and I thought, well, you know, maybe I could do this for a living. This would, uh, this would be kind of fun. But, you know, as a lot of amateur musicians know, it's not really easy to actually make a living and feed yourself doing that, uh, especially in Japan at that time. Um, so right around that time when I was kind of figuring out what the heck I was going to do with my life, there was an ad for Capcom. They were looking for music composers. Now keep in mind, I, you know, I wasn't really committed to this idea. I didn't think, oh, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I said, you know, I'll just send them a cassette tape, and you know, if they like it, they'll call me, and if they don't, big deal, I was only half serious about it. Uh, so I sent it off, they called back immediately, and they said, come and see us. Uh, I went there, and they said, hey, can you start in April? Um, and it went really well, and I was really, you know, pumped and enthused that, uh, that they dug my stuff enough to, uh, you know, invite me on board instantly. So that's the uh, beginning of my tale. There's a tendency in Japanese companies to kind of shuffle people around and get them in different departments to see what's going on. Um, so at first I was doing some bug checking on uh, a title called Muscle Bomber, which you will know as Saturday Night Slam Masters. So I actually did some bug checking there. Also right around that time there was a 16-bit uh, a PC in Japan that Sharp manufactured, the uh, X68000. Uh, and that was uh, you know comparable to like the Amiga or something like that, I believe, if you're going to compare it to a Western computer. Um, and we were porting Street Fighter 2 to that. And uh, it has a really good sound chip. It's got a Yamaha FM chip. And basically they asked me, hey, can you uh, transfer the arcade sound? into this FM chip for the Sharp 68000. Um, so that was one of the first things I did. And then right after that, they uh, were getting ready to port Saturday Night Slam Masters to the Genesis. And then I got on board there and started porting that music. So those are the first few things I was involved in right when I started with Capcom. Yeah, I would have to uh, credit uh, Keiji Inafune with, with being my, my mentor. Um, remember when I started at Capcom, I was, uh, you know, of course I was in sound, and not only that, it was pretty low level. I was kind of an assistant composer. Um, so it's not like I really had a, a lot of chance to communicate with them or, uh, or really work with them. Um, but anyway, so I'm working on sounds, and I'm doing you know, a couple Rockman games here and there, some Street Fighter games. Um, in fact, I don't know if you guys remember, but the, uh, I think it was called Street Fighter Real Battle on film. I used the, uh, the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie guys, and they're, they're digitized and put into the game as, as, as sprites. If you remember that game, that was, uh, that was me. I, I did the sound for that, so I send angry letters my way. But uh, anyways, back then, uh, you know, I would see Inafune-san around the office and, uh, 
you know, back then we didn't have the structure we have now. There weren't uh, producers the way we have them now. There were just guys that were higher up and guys that were lower down. It was a bit different then, but uh, just watching the way he dealt with people and the way he kept things under control, he was just such a good manager that, uh, you know, he probably had no idea who I was at the time. Um, even from uh, that early stage, you know, I'm like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. And, I, you know, I kind of followed uh, his career with, with great interest because, uh, you know, I kind of considered him a hero and still do. As I mentioned, you know, I studied architecture, um, and of course I'm doing nothing of the sort now, and I actually feel really bad for my parents for, uh, for paying for my education. Uh, needless to say, they get really good uh, Father's and Mother's Day presents for me, because I, I still feel really bad about, uh, you know, hey, Mom, Dad, sorry about the whole architecture degree thing. Um, but uh, anyways, you know, to say that there's a, a direct correlation with what I do now, there's probably nothing direct. I do remember the first time I messed around with CAD and seeing the 3D stuff and thinking, wow, games are going to change. They're going to be 3D one day. There's that. Uh, another way to look at it, too, is just the way of thinking uh, that goes along with studying something like architecture. The fact that uh, things have to be done in a certain order, that you lay the foundation, then you put up, you know, the skeleton of the building, then you do the, you know, the outside, uh, lastly. Um, things have to be done in a really specified order. And, uh, you know, games are similar, too, because you can't, uh, once you take a certain step, you can't easily just go back. You can't download a patch to a 20-story building, you know, this sort of thing. Um, so it, it is helpful, that way of thinking and that way of, uh, of creating something is really helpful in the games industry. Um, you know, even with, with something like Street Fighter, you know, you, you have to get the foundations in place before you make use eyebrows look pretty, uh, things like that. So it's just knowing what's important and in what order. Uh, just that way of thinking has definitely uh, helped me uh, in my career in games. Yeah, I, actually, I remember the expression on their faces when I uh, when I first told them. It was less disappointment and more just abject shock, like maybe they had misheard me or something. Um, you know, they knew that I was in the games. They they knew that I'd played games when I was a kid, and they uh, you know they saw me messing around on the computer and making games and whatnot. But you know, little did they suspect that I would ever try and make a career out of this. You know, and feed myself. Um, looking at it from an ordinary person's point of view, from the salary man point of view, I mean, what are games if not just toys, just like little toys to be trifled with? And and my own son is is going to start making stuff like that it was uh, it was pretty shocking to him I, I, I still really clearly remember the look on their face and it was uh, much less disappointment than just a whole lot of shock you know basically to put it simply I just I love Capcom and, and what I mean by that is not you know I don't love the, the company itself the building it's in whatever but uh, the fact that Capcom games have the, the certain essence the certain Capcomness about them um, you know and I'm not talking about just my own stuff I mean anything Takeuchi's involved in you know Kobayashi Inafune of course I mean these games have a real, real Capcom-ness to them, a real Capcom sense about them. Um, and I just really dig that, that Capcom quality uh, of these things. And the fact that I am actually able to participate in this process and make these things myself, I mean, that's, uh, that makes getting out of bed in the morning pretty easy, and that's what's kept me here for 14 years. Um, don't get me wrong, you're not going to catch me skipping to work and whistling every day. There's, uh, you know, there's times where I get kind of uh, depressed or feeling, uh, feeling down at work or whatever, but you know, everybody gets that. And uh, in the end, the fact that I have a chance to participate in, in this creative process that makes a, a Capcom product, I mean, that's, you can't beat it. Yeah, that's a really good question, and there's a couple of ways of approaching this. I think my answer now would differ than it uh, would have been had you asked me five or six years ago when we first met. Um, I think back then I was very much focused on reviews. If a game got a good score, it was a success. If it didn't get a good score, it was a failure. Um, and my way of thinking has kind of evolved in that. Uh, Nowadays you could say, and I'm going to take this in an interesting direction, so don't uh, think I'm crazy when I say that sales are important. What, what I mean by that is not, wow, look at all these millions of, of games I sold. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about each one of those uh, numbers, each game sold means somebody's playing and enjoying it. So even if there's only 10,000 people playing it or enjoying it, or 100,000 or a million, the fact that somebody's playing something we made and they're enjoying the crap out of it, that, that's a success no matter how you look at it. Um, and that's totally the way I look at it now. I mean, games are, are disposable when it comes down to it. People play them for a little bit and they shelve it or they sell it and they buy a new one and they forget all about it after that. But the people making it, we put, uh, you know, two, three years of our life into this, you know, 24 hours a day, that's what we do. Um, so, man, as long as somebody's enjoying it and enjoying the, the work we put into it and making it worthwhile for us, you know, that, that's a success. It, it doesn't boil down to, uh, to numbers for me, not the way I think now. Uh, there's two ways to answer that question. One would be as a uh, as a creator, as someone who makes games. Um, you know, obviously, if you get really bad reviews, and what, what comes along with that is that not a lot of people are going to play it, which which ties in with the idea of you know being a success, having people play it and enjoy it. Um, that's kind of the simple answer. Uh, I'm going to give you something deeper. As a manager uh, and producer, I think any game could be a failure if it is created without a guiding vision 
uh, throughout the whole process. If it's just kind of a hodgepodge of a bunch of different stuff and there's not uh, some guiding voice uh, keeping it on track, that's a failure even if it sells. If I take one of my own games as an example, you know, if I could uh, take the liberty of talking about Shadow of Rome for a moment, um, you know, it got okay reviews. Uh, you know, GameSpot gave it a good review, your checks in the mail. Um, it it uh, didn't do so well sales-wise, uh, unfortunately. But, you know, bottom line, we knew what it was going into it. We, we had a vision. We wanted to make a game specifically targeted for North America and Europe. Um, and we stuck on track and, and, and we did it almost as kind of an experiment to see what, uh, what kind of reaction we would get uh, from this, uh, what we wanted to be a, a Western targeted game. Um, so because we stayed on track, because the vision was sound, um, even though it didn't sell, I consider it a success. Now, if we'd taken an opposite track, had we said halfway through, oh, wait a minute, this might not sell, we should put some guns in it, and there should be like an underwater stage or all this other crap just for the sake of putting it in to get sales or something, at that point we would have lost our vision and the game would have been a failure even if it sold 10 million copies. What could I change? What would I change about the... This is, this is really philosophical, you guys are throwing me off guard here. Um, there's a couple of ways to approach this. I can look at it from the point of view of a creator or, or manager, even as a gamer, because I'm a gamer myself. Um, Let's see, this is probably not even something that's possible, but I'm gonna do kind of a, uh, a uh, pipe dream sort of scenario here, and I'm going to say, sometimes I think it would be nice if there was uh, one unified game platform. Um, you know, look at like TVs, you know, you can have all these different companies making TVs, but uh, they all get TV broadcasts. Uh, you know, they have different sizes of screens and, and different uh, buttons on the remote, but they all have the function of showing, uh, uh, you know, video broadcasts. You can watch your NBC or your HBO on any TV, no matter who makes it. Um, if you want to watch uh, DVDs by a DVD player and put it on there, if you want surround sound, you buy surround sound speakers. Once again, it doesn't matter what company makes these things, you know, their functionality is going to be the same. Um, you might remember back uh, in Japan there was a computer called the MSX and that was ASCII and Microsoft got together to make an OS and uh, somehow came up with this crazy like keyboard thing with a cartridge slot on it but uh, that was a really wide platform there was a lot of stuff going on on that and that kind of came close to what I'm talking about here if we could do something like that uh, uh, you know in the modern era um, it would just uh, we get more people to play games it would be you know this movement toward casual gaming and non-gamers playing stuff I mean if there was only one kind of game that's a really big hurdle for a lot of people who don't know a lot about games. If we really just had one type of games, the same way we have one type of, uh, of uh, you know, TV broadcast or something like that, then uh, I think we could really expand and do some crazy stuff. Um, keep in mind, I realize that's impossible, but uh, you know, if I had a genie in a bottle or, or a monkey hand or whatever, that's, that's what I'd go for. I can't necessarily use myself as an example. I don't want to tell you to study architecture and make a band to pick up chicks or whatever. Um, what I can tell you, and this does sort of tie into myself though, is don't limit yourself only to learning about games. The more other things you know, be it writing or history, whatever, the, the fresher your perspective is going to be on games. Games, it's such a wide open frontier right now where we're getting you know, these, these serious games and these casual games and all these, these, these phrases that didn't even exist a few years ago. It's a wide open frontier. Um, if the only people coming in this industry are people that studied programming only to make games or designing only to make games, um, you know, you're putting blinders on yourself really. Um, the more other things you know about, uh, the more other things you study, the more likely you're going to be to come up with uh, the next big thing and help expand the industry even further. Um, so my advice would be to study things other than games and more importantly than that, love games. You, you can't fake this. You either love games or you don't. Um, you know, me growing up, you know, I played a lot of PC games. I, I snuck uh, out to the arcades after school so my teacher wouldn't see me. Um, you know, of course, I had game systems at home, game systems I didn't own. I'd go to my friend's house to play them. You know, play a lot of games, play the biggest variety of games you can get your hands on. You know, just consume these things voraciously and just, you know, play as many as you can. Um, but also don't limit uh, your entire life to being just games or you're going to end up uh, actually kind of shooting yourself in the foot and the games you will make uh, will probably end up being limited in scope. So those are my two pieces of advice. Okay, I I'm gonna take what you might regard as the, as the easy way out, but wait for me to explain before you uh, groan and slap your forehead. I'm gonna say Star Wars, um, but let me explain why. I'm not talking about just the movies. The movies are cool and everything, but uh, I remember reading there was the official novelization, the, the Lucas approved novelization, and just uh, looking at all the detail in the backstory and just uh, experiencing the story as a whole. And uh, you know, if you look at it, look what you've got in here. You've got uh, uh, the love between parents and children, hatred between parents and children, uh, trusting friends, friends betraying you. Um, it really, it goes beyond being just a space opera. It's kind of a microcosm of, of society in general, of family relationships, of relationships with other people. So yeah, I mean, Star Wars kind of, it, it's got it all. So I'm, I'm gonna have to uh, take the cop-out answer and say Star Wars, but with, with a pretty decent explanation if I do say so myself. 
skydiving. I uh, just have never done it. Um, in favor of chance, I'd love to. The uh, you know the kind of terror of uh, of doing something really crazy and uh, risking your life is just seems like kind of a cool thing. And also seeing uh, the Earth from such a different angle. I mean, when do we really get to look straight down from that high up? That just seems like it'd be really cool um, to see everyday life from a totally different perspective. Um, let's see, if, if we're talking about uh, you know just uh, traditional art, like paintings and whatnot, that's gotta be H.R. Giger. If we're talking about architecture and design, that would be uh, Gaudi. And if we're talking about uh, music, I'd say Luigi Sakamoto would be, uh, th those are my top three uh, creative personalities, you could say. So what should I do here? If I tell you guys what porno actress I like, I don't know if you guys would be able to broadcast it, so I'll refrain on that one. I, the first girl I fell in love with, her name was Kumiko. I guess that uh, doesn't help you guys, but nobody else knows that. This, this is not that unusual for a Japanese, but certainly a lot of uh, Western people who know me wouldn't know this about me, is that uh, I'm actually pretty good at calligraphy, you know, like the traditional brush calligraphy. Um, you know, I only use that for writing really important letters, maybe to my parents or someone I'm really indebted to. Um, so they know this about me, but uh, very little else. I'm really kind of into the, uh, the old school calligraphy. I would uh, be really sad even if someone was joking if they told me straight up to die. That would really suck. So I guess uh, you could twist that around and say it's my favorite swear word if you uh, want to be creative. Actually, lately I'm really into Hawaiian music, and by lately it re really is like you know within the last year or so I started getting into it. Um, I used to be more into like rock and heavy metal and just your standard J-pop stuff, but uh, it didn't really do much for my mood. It's just kind of background noise. But what I find with Hawaiian music is, uh, you know, if I'm really stressed out, it helps me to relax, uh, gets the creative juices flowing, I can just kind of hit the reset button in my head and quit worrying about stuff. So a lot of times when I'm at work, I'll. Uh, uh, on really low volume, I'll get on the internet radio and have Hawaiian music playing in my cubicle. Uh, when, when, I, when I need to write a document or do something like that, it just uh, helps me be creative and just helps to relax me. Yeah, I, I'm a really big fan of the uh, Rainbow Six games, so I'm playing Rainbow Six Vegas 2 right now. I really, really dig those games. If I ever got fired from Capcom, I'd be knocking on Ubisoft's door the next morning. I'll put it to you that way, but I, I just can't get enough of uh, Rainbow Six Vegas 2 lately. And if anyone from Ubisoft is listening to this, uh, you know, if the worst happens, if anything bad happens to me and uh, I need a new job, get, get ready, I'm going to call you.